Hi, Chapel Street Church, and thanks for joining with us to worship today. If you're new with us today, we invite you to go to our Welcome Center, and after the service, we can meet you. We wanted to share a few things in the life of our church with you. Our annual meeting will be held this Saturday, September 14th, at our Kesslinger campus. This is a time to reflect on what God has done in the past year, hear about plans for the future, and participate in important decisions regarding our church's leadership and budget. Members, your presence and vote are vital. Non-members are welcome to attend as well. Absentee ballots and more information can be found at chapelstreet.church slash annual meeting. This October begins another year of Adventure Club. Kids in grades K through five are invited to join us in learning more about God through exploring the Bible. This action-packed evening includes creative Bible storytelling, singing, scripture memorization, crafts, and games. Kids can join in at the North Aurora campus on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. or Kesslinger on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. More information can be found and registration at chapelstreet.church kids. And it's not too early to start thinking about Christmas. Well, Christmas choir, that is. Our Christmas choir rehearsals will begin Sunday, October 6th. With just 10 rehearsals, the choir will prepare for our annual Christmas concerts, which will be presented over the second weekend of December. For questions or to join us, email worship at chapelstreetchurch.com. Finally, thanks to your generosity, God is doing some great things at our Shepherd's Heart Care Center, as we shared in last week's video. One of the ways your generosity helps is by being a pantry partner. Here's a short video to learn how you can help. Hi, my name is Erin Wise. I'm the director of our Shepherd's Heart Care Center, and I wanted to take the time to thank all of you that have faithfully prayed and donated to our food pantry. It's because of your donations that we are serving between seven and 800 families per month. Needless to say, with the volume of guests coming in, it's been a challenge to keep our shelves stocked. However, our great God provides through amazing people like you. Our need right now is for non-perishable items. If you haven't already signed up to be a pantry partner, would you consider helping us out in this way? It's so easy. You just pick up one of our blue canvas bags at any campus and pick one item such as cereal and fill that bag up with as much cereal as you can once a month. Bring your donation in at the campus you attend and drop it off at one of our pantry donation bins located in our lobbies. The crucial thing to note is when you sign up to be a pantry partner, stick to the one item you pick and be consistent in bringing in as much of that item as you can once a month. Many of you have asked me if you can just donate money to our pantry and the answer is yes. We are happy to accept your gift and shop for you. Signing up to be a pantry partner is easy. Just follow the link below. Thank you for being a part of this neighborhood ministry and showing our community God's amazing love for them. Yeah, I just want to say to those of you that are pantry partners, thank you. And perhaps you might consider doing that. Um, it, it makes a huge difference. The needs are growing. Uh, every time that we ask, there are, every time you step up, there are more needs. There are people that are hungry. And it's not just the food. You should know this. Uh, it's the food that you provide gives us an opportunity to talk about who Christ is with many of these people and see them come to find that there's hope beyond just being fed and cared for materially. So again, thanks for your generosity. Consider being a pantry partner. It makes a huge difference. And with apologies to Pastor Kenton, it's way too early to talk about Christmas in my opinion. Uh, but we are, uh, we are doing, I do want to mention that our annual meeting, as you heard a moment ago, is coming up. That's uh, this coming Saturday evening, the 14th, here on this campus at 6.30 p.m. Uh, every year, we, uh, our membership gathers to look back and uh, celebrate the things God has done, thank him for the way he's guided us through the ministry years, look forward in faith and hope to what he'll do and, and share our plans there. Um, so if you're a member, be there. Uh, if you can't be there, please uh, vote uh, absentee because it matters. And all are welcome, whether you're a member or brand new here, you're welcome to come and attend uh, and to hear more about what God is doing. So I encourage you to do that. Let's bow in prayer and ask God to speak to us through his word. Jesus, we just acknowledge that you're king of the universe and you're present with us in this place. And we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate through baptism what you alone can do, forgiving our sin, redeeming our life, give, making us new. 
so that we have no shame of the past. We have a present day with you that makes sense as purpose and a future hope that is secure. We thank you for that. And we ask you now to speak to us through your word. You've told us in your word that it's living and active and able to divide even our thoughts and our very souls. Sometimes we don't like it and sometimes we resist it, but we nevertheless need it. So speak to us this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Today we finish our little series on the church called What is the Church? Looking at four metaphors or images from the New Testament because there's no one place in the Bible you could look for a bullet point definition of the church, but there are many beautiful pictures and images of the church. And that's instructive to us because our identity and our purpose as God's people, part of the church in the world, is something that is not contained in a definition, but it needs many images to describe the richness and the power of what it means to be part of the church, even if we lose sight of that, and our culture certainly does at times. So we've looked at a a series of images. We started off with the body of Christ. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Each of us is a member of the body of Christ. The physical, tangible way that Christ interacts in the world is his church, his body and you are members of it if you're in Christ. And then we looked the next week at the bride of Christ. That's a weird one for some of us, that Jesus is the bridegroom and we're the bride. He loves us with a spousal love. We're treasured and precious and chosen by him. He's preparing a place for us as his bride. And last week, uh, Blake did a, a, a great job teaching us what it means to be the building, the temple, not the physical bricks and mortar, but the spiritual building, the dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We are living stones joined together, built together into a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And today we come to an image that probably will be a little strange for you to hear. Maybe you'll have some preconceived notions about that. It's the priesthood. What does it mean that the church is the priesthood of all believers? I don't know about your background. Maybe you grew up in a tradition, Orthodox or Roman Catholic or or Episcopal where they had priests. Maybe you had a great experience, a priest that was wonderful to your family, maybe not so great. Maybe you're less informed by your religious upbringing, but more by Hollywood when it comes to priests. Maybe when you think of priests, you think of this guy from The Princess Bride, right? That dweem within a dweem. If you don't know The Princess Bride, I'm not having a stroke. You can go watch that movie, right? Or, or this guy, Rowan Atkinson from uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, the bumbling priest in that wedding service. Or this, my favorite priest, from all of Hollywood, the, the priest in the movie Rudy. Do you remember this scene? Rudy wants to get into Notre Dame, who by the way just lost to NIU. So maybe Rudy should have gone here. Right. Sorry, I know, booze and cheers, forget that. Anyway, he, he wants to get into Notre Dame so bad and he's praying and he's praying and he says, Father, have I done enough? Have I done enough? And the old priest says to him, son, in over 40 years of religious study, I've learned only two incontrovertible truths. One, there is a God. And two, I am not him. (laughs) Words to live by. Uh, Those are Hollywood images. They're not biblical images. What does it mean that we're called the priesthood of believers? That might sound strange to you. We're going to look at uh, one primary text, but jump around quite a bit because this image is rich and it's throughout Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. As you come to him, that's Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's a remarkable passage. And we looked last week at this idea of uh, living stones built together into a dwelling which God dwells by, lives by his spirit. We're looking at this twice in this passage, Peter calls us a priesthood, a holy priesthood in verse five and a royal priesthood in verse nine. 
Now, Peter writes these words at a time when the temple in Jerusalem was still standing and operational. In 70 AD, it would be destroyed by the Roman armies, but it's still there. And there are still priests, Jewish priests, offering sacrifices on the altar. The Holy of Holies is still there when Peter writes this. Peter, by the way, was a Jew before when when Jesus called him to, uh, to follow him. His whole worldview was shaped by the Old Testament Jewish imagery of priests and priesthood. So why would he choose this image to talk about Gentiles now who are followers of Jesus, non-Jews? It's really a strange thing to say. The simplest definition I could give you of priests is this. The role of a priest is to represent God to the people and to represent the people to God. It's a two-way representation. They represent God to the people and they represent the people to God. We'll talk about how that's true of us. But first, let's go back, and I want to look at verses 9 and 10, sort of the centerpiece for us of this passage we just read. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. I want you to notice some of the things he says. But you are, he's telling us our identity now. You are now. Not you might be, not you will be, not if you work hard, not you should or you ought. You are. Chosen people. Royal priesthood. Holy nation. God's special possession. Do you see those markers? Chosen, royal, holy, special. That's who you are in Christ. And then the the specific identity names he gives us. A chosen people. Priesthood. A nation. And God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So we're chosen. We didn't belong to each other or to him before. We didn't have this identity. Now we are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's his mercy. We're just saying his mercy is more. It's his mercy that makes us his people. Not our effort, not our goodness, not our qualities, but his mercy is what brings us together. It makes us his people. We could spend weeks on every one of those statements. Perhaps we should someday. And next week we'll be in a new series uh, on this holy nation idea. By the way, just a little spoiler alert, it's not the USA. And it's not any physical nation on earth. The, a holy nation and a chosen race means we come together now, we're, something, we're a new kind of humanity in Christ. And our series next week is called Kingdom Citizens on the Beatitudes. Maybe the best place we could look to see the kingdom ethic of Jesus. And uh, Dr. John Dixon's gonna kick off this series. You won't wanna miss this as we talk about that. But today, we're gonna dig into what it means to be the priesthood. I mean, let me summarize this passage this way. We are God's people called to declare God's praises for the goal of God's glory. God's people called to declare his praises for the goal of his glory. That's, that's who you are, church. I, I think it's amazing. I know this is simple, but it's sometimes the most profound things are the simplest things. It's amazing how the, the New Testament vision for the church is all about you. No. God. The vision for the church is all about who God is. Yes, you have a role and we have an identity, but that's given to us by God and to be used for God. How different is that from how most of us are conditioned to think about it? I don't say this in any kind of shaming way, it's just true. We are are sort of pre-programmed in our culture to think about everything, church included, in terms of what am I receiving out of this? What is this doing for me? Is this meeting my needs? Is it good? Do I like the programs? Do I like the service? Is it, is it convenient? How's it, how's it affecting me and mine? How often do we, who call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus, turn that around? And instead of asking God, what am I receiving? How often do we ever ask, God, I can't believe you adopted me into your family. I can't believe you would give me mercy, make me new. What can I do for you? What, how can I bless you as a part of this community? How can I bring glory to you as a part of this church? Even as a pastor, I make that mistake. I think, I'm, I think about it in, in, in terms of, uh, that put me at the center. We all have a tendency to put ourselves at the center of every story. And we're not, he is. Uh, it, even this morning, I was thinking about this, is that the sermon's in the back of my mind. I'm thinking about the water temperature, and is it full enough, and is the camera angled right, and do we have the slides, and make sure everything's gonna be good for your experience. And you could, lose, you could forget that God is here by his spirit in our midst. 
We are his people. We're called to declare his praises for the goal of his glory. The doctrine of the priesthood of all believers states, this is J.V. Fesco, his definition helps us, I think, that all believers in Christ share in his priestly status. Therefore, there is no special class of people who mediate the knowledge, presence, and forgiveness of Christ to the rest of believers. You may have grown up or been conditioned to think, oh, there is a special class of people. And it doesn't mean that there aren't special, unique roles or callings. Of course there are. I have a different role and calling on my life than many of you. But it's saying there's not a privileged class. There are not super professional Christians in the church. We're all brothers and sisters. We all have a pre- we share in his priestly role. I think it's, um, as evangelicals we, uh, and Protestants, we, we maybe don't like the priesthood so much. We, 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 we trip up on that. But we do have a tendency to sort of punt ministry to the professionals. Do you know what I mean by that? I learned about this when I was a youth pastor many years ago. Parents who want the best teachers, tutors, coaches, trainers for their kids, and that's a good thing, could view the church this way. Okay, you're the, prof- you're the spiritual professionals. Here, here's Johnny. You take him and teach him religious stuff. You spiritually help him. That's not, you're the primary, by the way, uh, pastors in your kids' lives. The church is to come alongside you and help you shepherd them. But there aren't, a, there is not a professional class of Christians, in other words, is what Peter's telling us and the New Testament is telling us. But in the Old Testament, there was. In the Old Testament, there was absolutely a special class. There was a special lineage. You had to be from the tribe of uh, Levi, and you had to be of a dis- particular descendant, Aaron, Moses' brother, uh, to be a priest. By the way, have you ever heard the word priest and Levites, that term in, in, in the Bible, and ever wondered what's the difference between them? Are they the same thing? Anybody ever wonder that? Okay, let me give it to you simple. Uh, the priests are varsity, the Levites are junior varsity, and they can never be varsity. <laughs> so, so the Levites were in the right tribe, but not the right lineage. The priests served in the temple, and the Levites served the priests. So th- there's absolutely a class. Uh, and it, but, but even so, the Bible from front to back tells us that God's vision for his people was that, would be that all of them would be a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. Not just the New Testament. Look at Exodus chapter 19. And by the way, when I read this, think about the passage in 1 Peter 2 we just read. Peter is clearly echoing Israel's language here. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Treasured possession, holy nation, kingdom of priests. And Isaiah echoes this in Isaiah chapter 61. And you'll be called priests of the Lord, be named ministers of our God. You'll feed on the wealth of all nations and in their riches you'll boast. God's going to bless his people in the world, in other words. God's design has always been that his people would function as priests. We come to the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 5, we just read this. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And at the very end of the story, where all of this is headed, we're told, and they sang a new song saying, you, Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they'll reign on the earth. That's, it's always been God's vision from front to back that his people would be his priestly and royal representatives in the world purchased by the blood of Christ from every tribe, nation, and tongue. What that means is we just, we just sang about that, his mercy is more, and people are being made new, and we witness that in baptism. When you come to faith in Christ, it does not matter your ethnic background, racial background, economic, educational, social, like you come to faith in Jesus from all tribes and nations, you become part of a new humanity. Last week, uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse 15, Paul makes one new man out of, uh, out of the two. Paul says that Jesus does this. The early Christians thought of themselves as a new race, not ethnic and racial biologically, but spiritually. 
Because the Jews saw the world in terms of two groups, right? Jews and everybody else, Gentiles and non-Jews. And faith in Christ means whatever your identity marker before, now Jesus is your identity marker. And it does not matter where you came from. You're part of his chosen people. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Your national identity, your family identity, all those things take a back seat to Christ as our king. In the Old Testament, the king and royalty was separated from the priestly function. You never found a king that was also a priest. Uh, you did see a little hints of it in a guy called Melchizedek, but we don't have time for him. Um, at least not this morning. <laughs> but in the function of Israel, you see the, the, royal, the royal line and the priestly line were separate. But in Christ, they are perfectly united. That's why Peter can say you're a royal priesthood to us. Let me show you a little bit about what this means in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 16. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is an amazing passage. Jesus is our high priest. And I think it's tempting, and I've seen some of you behave this way at times, to think the person on the stage, the pastor, is sort of in a special class. They're holier, they're more spiritual. Maybe you grew up thinking like the, the priests were that way. And hopefully by now you know that's certainly not true about me uh, and about our staff. We, uh, we, don't, we have one high priest, and he knows exactly your life situations, your temptations, your pains, your struggles, your difficulties, and he knows all of it. The only difference between him and you is he lived it perfect. He's perfect, but he knows it. So he's not a priest that can't relate, in other words. And he's offered a perfect sacrifice, himself. How should we respond to a priest like that? Let us then approach God's throne of grace with fear and trembling, tiptoeing. What does he say? What does he say? Conf say it with confidence. 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 This is amazing. I don't think we grasp this. What Jesus has done should give you confidence before the Father. It's all, the whole function of the priesthood was a, a, a question of access. Who has access to God? In the Old Testament, Testament, it was mediated access. You were, God is holy, and we are, well, not holy. And to be in his presence would undo us. We needed someone, the priestly class, to follow the exact prescriptions that God prescribed to mediate God's presence for us, because we couldn't handle it. Jesus has done away with that. He is the high priest, who himself is the perfect sacrifice. He's opened the way and given you access to the Father. You should have confidence in your prayer life. You should have confidence in God's love for you. You should have confidence in knowing your identity in Christ. Because you have a great high priest. Hebrews 10, 11 and 12. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Sitting down is a symbol of the royal position on the throne and it's finished, the job is done. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Do you ever think about the Old Testament sacrificial system? Day after day on that altar, bulls and goats and sheep and rams and I mean, rivers of blood and smoke. I mean, where's it all going? What's it all doing? It's all flowing to the cross where once for all it's done. It's all pointing somewhere. The priesthood itself was pointed to Jesus. The altars pointed to Jesus. The sacrifices are pointed to Jesus. It's all aimed at him. And we're told he's done it. We should have confidence then. And Peter calls us a royal priesthood. Royalty we have trouble with, I think, in our culture. I, I mean, uh, 
We don't uh, in America know much about, we like when there's a royal scandal or a royal wedding, we get excited about that, but we don't really know about, we, knew, we know about celebrity, but not so much royalty. We know how to become YouTube celebrities, which is not a great thing at all, but um, we don't know really, like royalty you have to be born into or marry into, and even that there's some problems. Like you can't achieve royalty by effort or by going to a class or some graduation ceremony. You have to be born into that line. But the gospel says when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are adopted into the royal family. You have royal status. All that that means is placed on you in Christ. Think about that for just a minute. We are princes and princesses of the king because of Christ. There's no higher status than that. And then on top of it, we have a function of priesthood. Priesthood is also a bit hard for us because we, uh, for the Jewish mind, priests were a special class of people that again, you could not achieve, you could not earn, you could not like study and become one. You had to be born in the tribe of Levi and a descendant of Aaron. That's the only way. But in Christ, we've all been elevated to royal status and priestly status. Peter's saying the two highest classifications in, in, in Jewish society are, are yours in Christ. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, well, okay, we're priests, but you just told us, Pastor Jeff, that Jesus is the high priest, and he already offered the sacrifice. If the point of priests was to offer sacrifices, and the sacrifices aren't needed anymore, then what's the point of us anymore? Why are we, what's, what do we do as priests? What's the, why are we called that? Good question. We represent God to each other and to the world. Let me ask it this way. Have you ever had somebody represent God to you? Have you? Have you ever had someone pray for you and you felt that, that you were in God's presence when they prayed for you? Have you ever had somebody speak, share a passage of scripture with you? And you thought, oh, that's exactly what I needed. And you felt like God was giving it to you. I shared this with the men of First Friday just a couple of days ago when I was a college student, knucklehead, freshman at Wheaton College, playing football. My small group leader was our senior quarterback named Ben Furman, who had a 1978 Pontiac Trans Am black with a gold eagle. That was super cool. But that's not part of the story. <laughs> but in the end of our small group, he gave me a little card written on it, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things, holding promise for this life and the life to come. He gave me that and he said, Jeff, if you would commit yourself to training spiritually the way you do physically, there's no limit to what God could do with your life. I've kept that, memorized that. It was exactly the words. He, he was mediating God's presence to me when he gave me that little card. I'll share this uh, story with you. When I, um, my sin became exposed and known broadly, uh, I have struggled. I wrote in my journal a list of names that I needed to confess to personally. And it was like pages long. And I thought, I don't want to do this. This is going to be hard. It's, I'm full of shame. It's embarrassing. I didn't want to have to do this. But I can tell you every time, every time I sat with those people and told them, they gave grace to me. They mediated God's presence to me. It's a priestly function. You ever had someone do that for you? Share God's word, share, uh, pray for you, remind you that you're forgiven, point you to Christ. That's what it means to be a priest of all believers. And by the way, that's a privilege to do that for each other. What a privilege it is to do that for one another. And as a royal priesthood, we, we do have a sacrifice to offer. It's not bulls and goats and rams, but you have to offer a sacrifice. Do you know what it is? It's you. Here it is in, in Hebrews 13. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. A sacrifice of praise flowing out of lips that profess faith in Jesus, lives of generosity and service, that's the sacrifice God asks of us. That's our priestly function. Paul puts it in Romans 12, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, meaning your whole self, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
We're repeatedly commanded to praise God. This is our job. Do you ever think when you walk in the doors this morning, I've got work to do. I've got a job to do. I'm coming to the church and I've got to do something. Most of us think I'm gonna, I'm gonna receive something. I'm gonna experience something. But historically, classically, worship was called the work of the people. You walk in here, you have a role to play. You have a job to do in praising God, a sacrifice of praise. When I was younger, I didn't really, like when I was told that heaven involved praising God for eternity, I thought about that as like sitting on a cloud and singing hymns for all eternity. Honestly, I didn't say it, but I, didn't really, I thought, I don't know if I wanna go. <laughs> I didn't really like it that much. I'm not that good a singer, it's not kind of boring, isn't there football? What am I gonna do in heaven? <laughs> like, like when I was a kid. I don't think I really grasped what that meant. And by the way, as a young atheist, C.S. Lewis also struggled with the command that God has for his people to praise him. Lewis struggled with this. He said, why, why is God always asking and demanding us to praise him? Is God insecure? Like, is God so vain? Is he kind of a narcissist? He's like, is he like, hey, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit less than. Could all of you tell me how great I am? Like, is that what God's doing? Why is he saying, praise me, praise me? No. In calling us to praise him, God is not, he's not asking us to meet a need he has, but a need we have. And he's not doing, asking us to do something that's unnatural to us. This is what Lewis writes in a book called Reflections on the Psalms, uh, and a little chapter on, about praising. And I, it's helped me immensely. I hope it will you as well. The most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. That last line, the delight is incomplete until it is expressed. Okay, just take your mind out of church and religion and Christianity for a minute. And isn't this just true in life? Have you ever seen an awesome movie and thought, I'm never telling anyone about that movie? <laughs> Have you ever read a great book and thought, hope nobody else finds out about this? Or heard an incredible song and thought, mm, I wish this was on Spotify so it could just be mine? No, we want you, you, have you seen? Have you read? Did you hear? It's awesome. Parents do this, your kid walks for the first time, like the rehab walk, you know? They do this across the floor and you go, oh! They're gonna be an NFL star, you know? We wanna praise, we wanna share. We send pictures, we send little videos and photos. We delight to praise what we enjoy because the praising and the sharing of it completes it. Just a week and a half ago, I was on my back deck cleaning up some things. My wife said, look at the sunset. I looked to the west and you couldn't really see it because there's houses and trees. I could tell it was gonna be, we've had some really good ones lately. I love a late summer, early fall sunset in the Midwest. And so I went out in my street where there's less obstruction. I could see a little bit better and it was really beautiful. And for reasons I don't really, I, don't just, I got in my truck and drove west. And I went out to Nelson Lake Road and got to the Dick Young Forest Preserve. I got out of my car, turned on a worship song and just sat there. And it was amazing. And I took pictures and I put it on Facebook because I, and, I wanted to share it. And I noticed... Some of you did the same thing that same night, looking at the same sunset. Pastor John posted one, some of you posted those. Why? The heavens declare the glory of God. Isn't his handiwork amazing? What are we doing? We're praising. We're sharing in the glory. We're delighting together in who God is and what he's done. That's what praise means. And it's natural to us in almost every area of our life. Why wouldn't it be when it comes to God? If he's your greatest delight and your highest joy. We should, the delight is incomplete until it's expressed and shared. Isaiah 61, 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me in robes of righteousness and arrayed me in a garment of his glory. We are God's people called to declare God's praises for the purpose of God's glory. I had a neighbor years ago who was an old Christian guy and I asked him one time, well, what, what's your favorite Bible verse? And he said, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, without hesitation. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. It's a good summation of what it means to live a life of priests, of, of our king. I want to look at the last verse, uh, verse 11 and 12 of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. It's easy to miss this. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, what does he mean there? He means you are in the world where I placed you, 
You are citizens of whatever country, whatever nation you're in, but you don't really belong there. Not ultimately. Remember our identity marker conversation? Your first allegiance is to me. So in a sense, you are in the world as exiles, foreigners. I sent you there, but you belong to me and my kingdom. Abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, those who don't believe, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Live the kind of life that though the culture in which you live might say those Christians, they're the problem, how can they? But yet your neighbors would say, yeah, but I know her. Yeah, but I know him. And I, and I, and I see the kind of life he lives. I see something in their family. I've experienced their kindness. I know that they declare the, the glory of God. I don't necessarily believe in God, but there's something about that. You know what he's saying? That though the culture may revile you, live the kind of life that would be unavoidable, undeniable. People would see the glory of God in it. Whatever they may say. We are called to represent God to the world. A kingdom of priests. Royal priesthood. I want to close by reading to you something out of our Rooted celebration. How many of you have done Rooted? Been through Rooted classes? Good, that's great. I hope many of you who don't have your hands up will consider this this 10-week course, and at the end of the course, there's a, there's a celebration dinner with baptisms and testimonies and teaching, but one of the things, there's a commissioning of rooted graduates, and, uh, and I think it's perfect for what we're talking about this morning. The, the, each statement I'm going to read finishes with, because you are a minister of the gospel, I'm going to change it to, you are a royal priesthood. When you see someone in our church who has spiritual needs, who has experienced loss, brokenness, isolation, or loneliness... You will not just wait for the church to do something about it. You will step into that need because you are a royal priesthood. And when you hear that someone is sick and in the hospital or sick at home, you will not just wish there was someone who could help. You will visit that person and pray for them and rally their community to pray for them and care for them because you are a royal priesthood. And when you run into someone at work in your neighborhood or in your home that does not know Jesus, you will not just wait for someone else to share the good news. You're going to use it as an opportunity to share what Christ has done because you are a royal priesthood. And when you see a person caught in an area of sin, you not just look at them in judgment, you will pray for them, walk with them until that stronghold is broken because you are a royal priesthood. And when you come across a family or a marriage that is falling apart, you will not just hope that something changes. You will walk with them, sit in the mess with them, love them and pray for them because you are a royal priesthood. And when you come across someone who is struggling to make sense of this life and looking for their purpose, you will not just point them to the things the world can offer, but rather you'll point them to Jesus and invite them into community, lead them to experience what you already know because you are his royal priesthood. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our great high priest. And you have opened the way for us all and given us access to the heart of the Father. And we can approach you, Lord, with confidence. And not only that, but you've adopted us as sons and daughters into your royal line. We are royalty because of you, Jesus. And not only that, but you've given us a role to play in this world, to be your priestly representatives to each other and to the world. And we do this all for your glory. Jesus, our King and our great high priest. Amen. If you're here this morning and you'd like someone to pray with you, we say this every week and most of us go our way. But perhaps this morning you know that you need someone to pray for you and with you. We have members in our prayer team every week in that prayer room. We'd love to meet with you and to surround you with prayer. But now, brothers and sisters... Go in the mercy, grace, and love of Jesus, your great high priest. May you, who are in him, be his royal priesthood until he returns. Amen. And go in peace. And go Bears.